All right, and then we're going to be here in Hebrews chapter 3, and we're going to do verses 1 to 6. That will take us up for the rest of the evening, believe it or not. So whoever wants to read, read it. Therefore, holy brothers, you who share in a heavenly calling, consider Jesus the apostle and high priest of our confession, who was faithful to him who appointed him, just as Moses also was faithful in all God's house. For Jesus had been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, as much more glory as the builder of a house has more honor than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but a builder of all things is God. Now Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant, to testify to the things that were to be spoken later. But Christ is faithful over God's house as a son, and we are his house, if indeed we hold fast our confidence and our boasting in our hope. And some manuscripts add uh, their, our boast, hold fast our confidence and our boasting and our hope to the end, which I like that. Yeah, talking about remaining steadfast in the faith. Okay. Um, there's a couple, a couple interesting things, a couple interesting words used here uh, by the preacher. But the point of this section is because this is a this is a turning point. So this is a section that begins in 3.1 and is going to run through chapter 5, verse 10. Uh, basically, this section is going to be, if you had to put a title over it, the faithful and merciful high priest. So we've begun talking about, uh, as a quick review, who Christ is, what his titles are, how God acknowledges his son as our great high priest. And now we're going to talk about the high priest himself. And this, just as a, if you want to care about the structure of the text, it's going to alternate between doctrinal material. So it's going to read like a catechism. And it's going to alternate between this doctrinal material and what they call paranetic material. And what paranetic means is it's a, a, a term from rhetoric. So it is advice of what the appropriate course of action to take is. So that was a oration device they had back when everybody actually studied how to speak publicly and how to do it. And there were formulas that you followed for how to give uh, speeches given an oration. So this paranetic statements are advice of, okay, here's the appropriate course of action for you to take. So we're going to hear dogma. And then how do we react? How do we use that dogma, that doctrine? Okay. And then it begins right here in chapter 3, verse 1, which summarizes that whole preceding section. So we saw in chapter 1, verse 1 through 2, 4, how Jesus is the Son sent by the Father as his spokesman, and how he is the great high priest who sanctifies, makes holy his brothers in 2, 5 to uh, 2, 18. And then it's going to set up this very next section from 3, 2 to 3, 6, where we see Jesus as the anointed son who has been set over the things of God's house. Okay. And now this is also the first time that the preacher has directly addressed the people listening to the sermon or reading it, as the case may be. So calling us holy brothers. Uh, can also be translated brothers and sisters. Adelphoi in that context means you know men and women. Uh, so he's not just talking to the guys, he's talking to everybody. All right. And so this is the first time he directs, directly addresses the holy brothers sharing in the priestly holiness of Christ by sharing his sonship. So therefore, holy brothers, who you share in a heavenly calling, consider Jesus the apostle and high priest of our confession. Uh, so they are participators, or I'm sorry, partakers of a heavenly calling because, like we said earlier, Christ shared in our, he experienced our flesh and blood, still experiences our flesh and blood. Therefore, we are uh, 
he participated in our flesh so that we can participate in his heavenly sonship. Uh, which means we are sharing in Christ's uh, work as God's anointed son. Christ means the anointed one of God. So I think it was Luther, don't quote me on this, but I'm pretty sure it was Luther who called us little Christs. And that this is what he meant. This is from this passage in Hebrews. So we are participating in everything which Christ is. So that makes us little Christs, little anointed ones of God. And we'll see that in verse uh, 14 of the same chapter, I think. Uh, For we have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. There's that phrase, to the end. So the reason why it's a heavenly calling is because God calls us to participate in Christ's glory, which we saw back in 2.10. Actually, somebody read 2.10 through 12. That would be a good review. For it was fitting that he, for whom and by whom all things exist, and bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. For he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source. That is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers, saying, I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. Did I read the wrong thing? No, you read the right thing. I was I was reading something else. Yep. Okay, so we are all brothers participating in his glory. And we are members of a heavenly house, which we'll see at the end, what we saw at the end of this passage in six. Uh, But Christ is faithful over God's house as a son. And we are his house if indeed we hold fast to our confidence. And then if you look at 12, 22 and 23, he's also going to touch on that, which we'll come to all of this when we get there. I like pointing out how everything is interconnected, like it is. Uh, 12, 22, and 23, which says, But you have come to Mount Zion, and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn, uh, assembly can also be read church, uh, of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect. Okay, so we're members not only of the church visible, the church we see here on earth, which may have non-believers in it because we can't see in people's hearts. But we, when we look at the church on earth, it's what we can see. But it's also talking about the church invisible, particularly the church invisible already in heaven, which we have not yet seen with our eyes, but we will. Okay, so... What the preacher is saying is, I'll make sure I'm going to say this right. So one of these things that the preacher is, is asking us to do is since we've received our status, we've received our vocation from Christ, he wants us to consider Christ now with eyes of faith. So before we were looking at, you know, the priesthood with with eyes of history. We're looking at what all was involved and we're comparing it to what what we have now. Now let's look with our eyes of faith and consider the implications of what our confession of faith really is, uh, which began in baptism, or we would say what you learned in catechism and confirmation. So what are the look with your eyes of faith on what the implications are of what you believe and confess. And it's interesting. That's all just in verse one. Okay, so consider Jesus the apostle and high priest of our confession. And this isn't confession of 
confessing my sins, but our confession, what do you believe? Uh, the word used for confess is only used a few times in the New Testament, but it is, uh, the, the noun is homo logias. Did I say that right? Logias. Yeah, homo logias. So logos is word. Homo means same. So the same word. So confession, the same word means, okay, we're of all of one mind, one doctrine. Um, we have one faith. That's a big implication right there, first of all. So what does that mean to be of one word, if we interpret it literally, to be of one word? Discuss. <laughs> God's word? Mm -hmm. There's a lot of words in God's word, though. So why is there so many churches? I mean, are we... Are we of the same what? I'm confused. In the end, we all believe in Christ, and Christ died for our sins on the cross. <coughs> Through him, we're redeemed. And that's... That's pretty solid right there. I think we can agree on that. Yeah, so what are the implications of being of one belief? What does that imply for us? You get something done. Hmm? You get something accomplished, if nothing else, spreading the... The, I, I don't know if they believe, but since we're talking religion, belief or idea, if you don't have unity, you may disagree in, in the process, but you don't disagree in the purpose. Okay. And so that's why we have, I think we have different religions, you know, we, uh, and naturally in the process, you get more diversion, but if we are, if we're unified, in the purpose, even if we disagree in the process of how we get there, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. it's still we still are on one mind, and we take in. So. Okay, good, good. Now I'm gonna play devil's advocate for a minute, and you guys can think about this for a second. Uh, so that's how we deal with all our other kind of Christians we got around here, because we got. I mean, how many, how many, how many denominations of Christianity do you think there are? And I think it last. Depends on the definition of Christianity, too. Yeah, and I think it, I think it last count. Nine denominations that think they're Christians but aren't. Yeah, and we're going to go there in a second. But I think it last count, it was something like two hundred, just here in America. It's like ridiculous. Like there's. I mean, basically, anytime anybody disagreed with somebody about something else, they spun out from another denomination. So, you know, you have your big categories, but there, yeah, there's like 200 different churches in this country that are ostensibly Christian. Okay, but if we, if we acknowledge the one thing, the one center thing is Christ. So we believe Christ died for my sins. Christ was born to be the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the world. And he died for them. So those sins be taken away and he rose from the dead to conquer death so that I can live forever in, in heaven and the new earth. If we agree on that, okay, that's Christian. That's, that's the core gospel. That's, that's John 3.16. If, if we agree on John 3.16, you got it. That's the, that's the gospel in a nutshell. Okay, well, what about all the other paths to God that we have? I mean... The Jews are God's chosen people. What about them? What a, the Jews are God's chosen people. What about them? What about Muslims? What about you know Buddhists and Hindus? Think about that, and we'll talk about it in just a second. You have to excuse me in just a minute. So think about that. How would we respond when we have, interact with people who are not Christian? And how do we do that in love without just alienating them and stopping the conversation before you get started? Well, you converse with them. Well, they're thinking the same thing. Pardon? They're thinking the same thing. Yeah. How can they get us to come to the right. <laughs> without being offended? And, you know. So. Well, it depends. I mean, you either follow my ways or I'll chop your head off. 
Okay. You know, like the Muslims are doing in some cases. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, that's kind of direct, but not agreeing, willing to listen. Well, we did the same thing with the Crusades. Oh, yeah. We did the uh, same thing with the uh, Jewish people in Spain. So taxes during the Inquisition. Germans, <laughs> Germany, the Bombards in Russia. Throughout history, they've been you know, forced to confess. But I think we need to take our cue from Christ. Yeah. He yeah. never antagonized the general populace. The common people. The ones he antagonized were the religious leaders because they supposedly knew better because they had the Old Testament. If they were the religious leaders as they claimed they were, then they should not have been so arrogant and looking down on the people under them as far as the Jews are concerned. They have Moses and the prophets. Even if a man should rise from the dead, they will not believe it. Right? Right, so what did I miss? What did you guys come up with? Anything? Well, some of the comments were that with the Muslims today, if you don't adhere to their beliefs, they will chop your head off or whatever. Mm -hmm. But... We didn't do anything less during the Crusades. Yeah, I mean, I mean, we. Yeah, you we, can't brush off the Crusades. That was pretty bad. <laughs> or what we did in the name of Christ to anybody who did not espouse mm -hmm. Jesus as the Messiah, the Jews in particular. Yeah, I mean the the Church of the of the Renaissance, early Renaissance, end of the Middle Ages, uh, had numerous sins against the Jews, you know, the forced conversions, because the Jews got kicked out of every country they ever settled in, <coughs> most of the time more than once. And then when Ferdinand and Isabella kicked the Jews out of Spain, uh, Rome took them at a price. They forced converted and then charged them for the privilege of it. And that was under Alexander the Sixth, uh, who was also happened to be Spanish of all things. Uh, so yeah, you got that. You got the Crusades. Is always trot the Crusades out, even though the Crusades, for the most part, after maybe the Second Crusade, were never about Christianity. Really, it was half the time the Crusaders didn't even make it to the Holy Land. Like they, I remember one. I forgot which one it was, but they never made it to the Holy Land. They made it as far as Venice, and they sacked Venice. Just, these guys were just mercenaries. But that was the danger of not being of one confession, being of one word, because the church then was telling people, well, if you go fight in the Crusades, you can get a soul out of hell, purgatory, whatever you wanted to call it. You know, if, if dad died a heretic, if you go fight in the Crusades, he gets out of hell free. And people went and fought for that reason. So that's using... Where is that in God's word? Nowhere. Uh, you know, so there were there was a lot of travesties committed in the name of Christianity. And there still are. And there still are. There there still are. It's a man messing it up. Yeah. Uh, it's, but again, it's every time, and, and that's probably why we have so many denominations too, mm -hmm. because man has to put his two cents in. You can't just let it rest on the... I mean, the word of God's complicated enough w without us adding all kinds of stuff to it. Is it really, though? No, it really isn't. <laughs> I'm not going to let that go by. <laughs> I, mean, it, I mean, the rabbit hole gets deeper the more we study it because it is so intricate. But the reality is the Gospels, John 3, 16, that's what the Bible summarized says, for God so loved, well, God loved the world in this way. He sent his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish. That's, that's all you need to know. It's hard for us to not want to control what we say, do, and believe. And it's hard for us to not want to participate in it. And that's that's why the, the heresy, we talked about this earlier, the heresy of semi-Pelagianism. Pelagianism is, is a heresy where I cooperate with God in my salvation, which 
that's where a lot of your decision-based theology, so many of these denominations days, I have to make a decision for Christ because then I'm an active participant in my salvation. I chose to do it. And then you have the semi-Pelagianism, which, which just is, well, God saves you, but you got to do your little bit. So it's like not like full on Pelagianism, but I still have my little tiny bit of participation because it's me. I've got to do something. It can't be free. That's the problem. That's what we twist that verse. Faith without works is dead. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. All right. Yeah, you know, it's like, oh, see, so you got to do works. No, you don't. You you've got to do works because you were saved. You can't help but do them. That's yeah. Anyway. So great. That's how we wound up with 10,000 different kinds of Christians. But so well, what about the Jews, though? I mean, they've had, they've had it kind of tough. Aren't they still God's chosen people? They're still God's chosen people. And they're they will be saved. Mm -hmm. so I might disagree with your, your translation of, or interpretation of, of Revelation. God, yeah, I mean... They were God's chosen people because that's from whom the Messiah came and the Messiah came. But they're no longer set apart from God's chosen people anymore. I mean, God used them for what they were chosen for and then they should have followed the Messiah. Uh, so uh, that's, that's one we might have to talk about. Some more. <laughs> yeah, but that is why, you know, and that's why we see and it's going to sound really bad, but that's why you have so many Christians are blindly supporting Zionism because they think if we don't support you know, Israel, Jesus is never going to come back because the Bible says, it's like, yeah, but that's not what the Bible actually says. You know, support them for other reasons, but that's not the reason. Uh, Aren't the Jews back still... Regardless. Hmm? Back it's coming back regardless, exactly. Oh. Oh. Aren't the Jews still God's chosen people? I would say no, they are not. Because the the purpose for which they were set apart came, um, okay. you know. So that I mean, you have you have your messianic Jews, which is even kind of kind of kosher to make a bad pun, but uh, because they still follow all of the uh, legalism of Judaism, but they believe the Messiah came and they follow you know worship Jesus. So okay, that's kind of a hybrid, uh, and then you just have. Um, you have Jews that just are still looking for the Messiah to come. The Bible tells us clearly it's, it's belief in Christ that saves. So I, w I would say no. Well, again, that, that it's a little bit more involved than that, but I, that's what I would say. Well, what about Islam? Well, what about Islam? They believe, don't they believe in the same God we do? No, no. Dead giveaway. If I'm asking the question, the answer is probably no. So, so right. So, this can turn into God is very judgmental. That's it. Yeah, I mean the the God that Luther was so afraid of before the Reformation is exactly what the God of Islam is. It's just just smiting incarnate it, because it's all works right works righteousness. Uh, uh, Islam is all about you and what you do. Here's these five things you got to do. And if you do those five things, you're going to heaven. But there's no Christ in Islam. It's only God, this vague, you know, Allah just means God. Uh, there's no Christ. There's no Trinity. You know, that's one of the things they accuse us of is being polytheistic because they like, how can God be three? Well, he's not because he's one, but there's three in one. And they're like, that's okay. Uh, it's modalism, Patrick. Give them the uh, example of the egg that we used in Sunday school. Huh? Give them the example of the egg that they were used in Sunday school. Right. The three in one. Right. Uh, so, and they're like, well, you know, Allah revealed, you know, Gabriel gave Muhammad the Quran to correct the errors that crept into Judaism and Christianity. Uh, but no, you know, so no, that's not the same God. And I would say that Jews do not worship the same God we do because they don't. They do not worship the triune God. And oddly enough, the triune God is there in the Old Testament. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, he's there. All three persons are there. Uh, but not is the it, same God. Is it 
wrong. Sometimes the person, I, I wonder about, I'm hoping that everything is really all right that I'm believing. I mean, did it really come down the line that all of this is really what mm -hmm. it should be? And yeah. sometimes I wonder, or I say, I hope I'm getting this all right. Yep. And, I mean, I'll just say this, with all those denominations out there, somebody has got to have it right, and everybody else is wrong. Yeah. Well, I got news for you. The Missouri Synod of Lutherans have it right. <laughs> yeah. What else am I going to tell you? But does that mean all these other kind of Christians aren't going? Well, of course they're going to heaven because they have Jesus. They understand that. That's the that is the one word, the the you know the homo logon that we're talking about, hom, homo logius that we're talking about. That we have that in common confession. That much is true. Uh, but these other ones, no, all these people that want to tell you that, and, and if you don't believe this, you're a meanie and you're being exclusive and that's not right by telling all these other people that what they believe is nonsense. Sorry, that's what we're called to do. So no, the Muslims do not believe in the same God we do. No, modern Jews do not believe in the same God we do. Is the God of the Old Testament that we read about and the God of the Old Testament that they are reading about the same God? Yeah, they are. But that's not today. You know, a few things have happened in the last 2,000 years. Uh, the Mormons, like, okay, whatever. Uh, it's interesting to look at the parallels between Islam and Mormonism. They track exactly the same with their beliefs uh, until you get to the whole part about Mormons get their own planet when they die, which is kind of neat. But oh, you get your own planet when you die. You've never heard that part. So here's the thing. So when you go to heaven, because they also don't believe Jesus is God, by the way. So they're not Christians, much as the Church of Jesus Christ, though. No, yeah, they call themselves that, but they don't believe in the actual Jesus of the Bible. So they believe Jesus is the super guy. And that, you know, because he was such a super guy, he got earth to be the savior of. And then when you die, you get to be God of your own planet. Yeah. No, I'm serious. That, I'm not making that up. So if, you, as, as, so if you're reading along in the Book of, uh, Book of Mormon and you can get through it and you go, okay, it's like, yeah, <laughs> this is a little sketchy, but all right. And then, but when you get to that part, you just got to go, no. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm being a little facetious about it, but yeah, that's what they believe. You know, it's, it's basically just like, you know, God is the father of us all, right? So Jesus is, you know, the God of us on earth. And then you get your own, you get to be your own big, that's, yeah, it's a thing. Uh, so Mormonism, kind of cuckoo. Uh, and then you have all the polytheistic religions in the world. And it's like, but do, do they have a, are they somehow going to find their way to the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of our father? No, they're not. They're, they're not going to get there. They're not going to get to Christ with this belief system. Um, and despite the pressure of the world that wants us to go, well, you know, we all got to get along. We should be nice to other people. They're free to have that belief. But I'm not going to tell them they're going to heaven and we're all going to wind up in the same place. I'm not going to do it. That's compromising the faith. You know, we got enough fights with each other about stuff that we can still, at the end of the day, all agree we're going to the same place. But some of this stuff, no. Um, and Islam especially, and I'm going to pick on them because it's going to become a problem in this country eventually. The, the playbook they have for how to do what they do, and, and they've been practicing it since about the year 900 or whenever Muhammad came on the scene, is, okay, well, they can't just take over and force people to convert. Well, what you do is you go settle in a territory, and it's just a little group of us, and, hey, we're very nice. I see you guys are religious. We're really religious, too. It's kind of the same God, but, you know, we don't have to talk about that. It's cool. We can just get along. We just want the freedom to worship our God in our little spot. Okay, you do that. And then they enter a territory and then they expand until they have a majority, at which point religious law, Sharia, can take over and then they drop down the hammer. Okay, you have to convert or 
pay the tax, basically. So everybody says, oh, you have to convert or die. It doesn't go that extreme that fast. But it does say, okay, you can, in a, in a Muslim-dominated territory now, you, yeah, you can have a Christian church, better not have a cross on it. You can't have any external markings to let people know that that's what it is. You got to keep it on the down low big time. Uh, and then you got to kick us a little tax. You got you to pay the fee for us to allow you to exist because you are people of the book. You've just lost your way. We're hoping you'll convert and find your way. And eventually we'll get tired of waiting and then we'll chop your head off. But, but in the meantime, you have to kick up the tax. We're going to get along with you just fine. And it's... it's how it works. Uh, and you see that happening in Europe. You see that happening in France. You see that happening in Germany. Of course, Germany has so much baggage, they can't say anything against anyone ever again. And that is why it happened there first, uh, where they're really gaining a toehold. And you may see that become a Muslim-dominant country at some point because they, they are playing the long game and, and they will eventually do this. Because that's how they expand. That's how they grow. Um, I really find, though, that most, I'll say Christians in parentheses, but really don't, they don't really want to talk that people might, or think that people, some of them, many of them are going to go to hell. They don't like to use that word hell. No, no. No, and and that's... Well, well, God will be good to everybody. God loves us all. Yeah, because God doesn't want anybody to be lost. And that's true. The Bible says that. He wants all people to be saved. But, but these are people that, you know, you and I probably know that are in our churches. They, they just, you know, they'll say all this stuff, but they really don't believe that maybe many are going to go to hell. Yeah, there was a great, there's a great book called The Hammer of God uh, by Bo Gerritz. He was a great Scandinavian, forgot what flavor, uh, Lutheran pastor wrote this book. And he wrote this book for young pastors, basically, but anybody could read this and get a lot out of it. And basically, it takes place in these couple of rural churches in the middle of Scandinavia across several different uh, decades. But same church, characters change. Yeah. Uh, but And you see these three cross-sections of the life of this church. And basically, you see these young preachers, and he's like, you know, uh, I always forgot the point I was going to try to make of the whole thing, and that's stupid. Say, I hate when this happens. Oh, and the young one of the young preachers was lamenting. Is like, but I'm concerned. You know, he's talking to one of the older priests, and he's like, you know, I'm concerned because, you know, I have all this knowledge from this about God. I know all this stuff, but I wonder, do I actually believe it? I'm question: Do I have real faith, or do I just do I just have knowledge? Do I actually have living faith in the Preacher goes, well, go preach to the people until you have faith, is what he says. He goes, that's, you, you're you concerned about having faith? Go preach to the people until you have it. Which I thought was neat because, man, sometimes you really question, like, yeah, I teach people all this stuff, but like, am I just teaching it? Do I, I mean, or am I, am I you really do question sometimes, like, do, do, do I actually have faith or am I just imparting knowledge? It's just part of our life. I mean, I've grown up with it. Never thought of anything else. Um, sometimes I admire or envy um, late late bloomers, people that are older and, and have not been in Christ. And then they find, you know, they through through the Bible, through friends, they you know they believe. And I'm thinking, you know, what what a glorious feeling. I never particularly went to that. Oh, I'm so happy because I had you know. Mm-hmm. Because you don't know any other way. It's my way right, life. right. And so I... Um. Now, that is what is so interesting, and I'm sure it's like this in every denomination when someone joins the church uh, as an adult, and their sinner goes like, wow, that you all of a sudden you've, you've made a new Lutheran, and they know doctrine better than 90% of the people in your pew that have been Lutherans their whole life yeah. because they came to it late, and they're like, oh, wow, look at this truth, and they just lay hold of it like 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 a life raft, and it, it's amazing, and it's like stuff that you're like, oh, yeah, I've been known that since I was, you know, knee-high to a duck. Well, 
yeah, we kind of take some stuff for granted. But the, just to see someone have that assurance, it's like, no. I never knew. And it's like, this is great. It's on the call, uh, the, you know, on Rudy, well, the call in uh, radio programs where they come on Saturday morning is really a good time to listen <laughs> to Irwin Luther. But anyway, I uh, someone called in the other day to, to your point. We know that we know because we were raised with it. Called and the question was, if we are, if Christ told the disciples to go baptize, you know, and name the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, why was Jesus baptized? Wow, I get to have this conversation twice in one day. This is awesome. What, yeah, and it was, and that, and that, and that, and that, and like, oh yeah. You know, he didn't sin, so he didn't have, even though St. John Baptist was a rapid baptism of repentance, he had a repentance. You know, you know. And it was just, it, it did, the fact that this question really hit me is, wow, I didn't you know. Yeah, I'm ho actually hoping some of this is where we're going to wrap up tonight on this question because this this is one of those questions it's not easy to answer. Yeah. Okay, so John the Baptist was baptizing why? What was the point of it? For repentance. For repentance yes. to the forgiveness of sins to prepare people to meet the Messiah. He's coming. All right. So it's no different than any of the other things that they did in the Old Testament. You had these are this is for sin, right? So you had uh, you had ritual washings, purification, pre, like we talked about, the priests purifying themselves through sacrifice before they do it on behalf of the people. So John is purifying these people to prepare to meet the Messiah. And then here comes his cousin Jesus, comes walking down to the Jordan one day and goes, and John goes, Really? You should be baptizing me. You've got to be kidding me. Why are we doing this? And Jesus says, to fulfill all righteousness. Yeah. Oh, great. Why did Jesus have to be baptized? To fulfill all righteousness. Hmm. Okay, what does that mean? Oh, okay. Well, let's see. Righteousness. Um, sinner's baptism. Jesus wasn't a sinner. So why did Jesus? We're right back to Why did Jesus have to be baptized? Okay, it's a sinner's baptism. Okay. So why did Jesus have to be baptized? He was taking on everybody's sin. Right. So he's going to take on the sins of the world. Therefore, to fulfill all righteousness, he's going to do, even though he's without sin, he's going to do everything a sinner does, except actually sin. So he grew up. That's why he had to take on our flesh, right? And why he still has our flesh to this day. I mean, does that bother anybody else that, like, God who spoke the universe into existence, entered our frail human bodies. Mm -hmm. And he still got one. It's not like he left it and when he ascended into heaven, he's got it with him, which is neat because we're going to have glorified bodies like that one day. But it's like, that's kind of a step down from God to a God with a human body now. Mm -hmm. that That's the humiliation. That's why you see me in the Nicene Creed and, you know, and he was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and became man. And I bow at that point because that's the humiliation. That's when God entered our flesh and that's a permanent condition. Okay. So he enters our flesh, permanent condition, goes down in the Jordan because sinners get baptized, but he's never sinned. So he's going to take on the sins of the world. So he experienced everything we do. He grew up, he got hungry, he cried, you know, he laughed. You know, he joked. He was tempted. He was tempted. Mm -hmm. Good, because why did he go into the wilderness to be tempted? Because the devil goes, hey, I know you. This is new. What? What's why? We got to check this out because I wonder. God in human form. Let's see what you're made of. And he had proved that. Mm -hmm. And then immediately after he gets baptized, by the way. But the spirit, so the spirit that. drives him out there and goes, okay, time to get tested because we're tempted, we're tested, but he passed all that. And that voice said what to him when he got baptized? Okay, so Christ means anointed. the anointed one. So he was anointed with the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. at his baptism. Why do you have to get baptized? That is... I don't want to say he was the Christ from before the foundation of the world, but we're humans. We need things in certain time and space. So you want to say, well, that's the anointing. That is his anointing. Just as all these priests were consecrated in the Old Testament, 
I'm not saying that this is the moment it happens. It's a moment for us to think of. Okay, so as the one that's going to become sin for us, God says, that's my son. Still, he's still my son. And not only that, I'm well pleased with him. And here's the Holy Spirit. I have anointed him with the Holy Spirit. He is my Christ. Now he's going to go do this for you. That's why he had to get baptized. And then, as my professor always says, well, you know, John's baptizing all these people in Jordan, washing their sins away, and then Jesus goes into Jordan because he's going to suck them all up. Yeah. Not when he got baptized, but on the cross. Yeah. He's going to soak up all the sins of the world, and he's going to leave them there. Uh, so that's why he had to be baptized. So you have John the Baptist's baptism for the remission of sins. You have Jesus getting baptized because... He's the anointed one. He's going to take on the sins of the world, so he has to be prepared. And then you have Christian baptism. So there's three baptisms going on. Uh, people want to mix them up, and that gets complicated. Then, so you got to talk about the baptism John baptized with. What happened to Jesus is a one-time thing because he's God. And then you have every Christian baptism after that. Uh, you can't mix them together. It was just interesting, you know, and the way it, it, the just not even the answer, but the question, you know, because like, you don't think of it. You're just like, oh yeah, Jesus went and got baptized. Okay, and you're like, but why? And then usually they'll, they'll, you you have a conversation with whoever the teacher is, and it goes on for about fifteen minutes, and you get done, and your question is still, but why? And still even go home think about what I just said and you're still going to go, but why? <laughs> it's very, it's not, there's not a two minute answer. Um, and I don't know that my answer is that thorough or authoritative. It's just one of those things. It's not easy. Um, I kind of hope we have some Bible study when we get up to heaven so that we can all sit around and ask some of these questions. <laughs> but I'm kind of hoping it's going to be more like on the Emmaus road and we're just going to go, I can get it. Yeah. <laughs> And of course, there will, will be without sin, so I will not get to say, I told you so, but, <laughs> oh well, but I told you so, we were right. Yeah, I, I think, I, because I personally think it will be interesting to go, well, who really did have it right? And you find out nobody got it right, 100%, and you just go, oh, okay, I accept that. Uh, but I, I really want that question answered, and I know it's not going to be, it's not going to matter. But it's kind of just like, well, what parts did we get right and get wrong? I often wonder what our religion is going to roll down and boil down to, let's say, six, eight hundred thousand years from now, what, what, what it's going to be. Mm. You know, or how well, how well the, the real truth is going to come out, you know, can stay with it. I mean, the good thing is scripture tells us that, that the word of the Lord endures forever. Okay. So there will always be somebody that, yeah. There will always be, no, even Reve you know, Revelation tells us, no matter how bad it gets, and right before the end, it's going to get really, really bad, it says. Uh, oh, it must be like now. No, it's going to get really, really bad. Uh, but there will always be someone left, at least one, <laughs> at least one, always. And I'll guarantee he's a Missouri Sin Lutheran. We think that we have it right. Yeah. We have it right, especially the Lutheran Church. We have it right. Yeah. Yeah, we, but. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, so that word coming all the way back to, you know, the being of one word, the being of one word, it's like, so what are the implications? There was a lot of implications in this discussion we had that, that we just take for granted. It's like, oh, yeah, well, you know. But what does that imply to be of one word? And it means to be of one faith, of one faith and one faith in Christ. Christ. Yeah. So you can you can add all these accoutrements to it and all these rituals and whatever you want to in words of man, but in the end, that's what matters. Capital if you, if you w. got that? Hmm? Capital W. Capital W. <laughs> all right. That's where we're going to end it for tonight. And we'll be back strictly in Hebrews next week. So I don't think I'm going to take any more excursions because, wow, those took a long time. <laughs> That's a good review. Actually, we will be back in the book of Numbers briefly next week for part of, of the text we read tonight.
Questions, comments? Uh, if anybody wants to read ahead, uh, you can read Numbers chapter 12. Yeah, Numbers 12. I think you need a new pen. Parts and rights. But whole parts of it, but the little bit rights. I like it. A pen without ink is not a pen. That sounds profound. Some philosopher probably said that. Number 12, you said? Number 12. I mean, the greatest philosopher of all time said, a flute without holes is not a flute, but a donut without a hole is a Danish. <laughs> Chevy Chase and Caddyshack. Anyway. Oh, yeah. Number 12. Okay, let's close tonight with the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.